purpose of meditating, of doing some musical meditations before we begin, is to sort of lift up everybody into a different level, to be able to hear what we're going to be saying here on a whole different level. And the reason is because music itself, according to Kabbalistic teachings, is actually coming from a very high world, from a very high place. From a place called the Throne of Glory. That's what the Kabbalists teach. This Throne of Glory is a state of consciousness, a state of being, which is, a, which is the same place, Kabbalistically, that is the source or the root of our souls, where our souls come from. It's also the same place, the same root from which the Torah, the Torah comes from as well. So when we connect musically to this higher place, so we're connecting to the root of our souls as well. And when we connect to that place, then we hear things differently. So when we begin our session to open up our hearts and our souls a little bit, so that we hear the information, not only on an intellectual level, but on more of a soul level as well. It is Hashem Sefatai Tiftach those words is, God open up my lips, God please open up my lips, God please open up my lips, may my mouth, may my mouth sing your praise. We say that line, we say that verse. Right at the beginning of the silent prayer that we pray three times a day. And the intention of saying that verse, that God open up my mouth and open up my lips to sing your praise, is that we're asking God to speak through us. That when we teach, let the teaching be a teaching that's coming from the highest places. And that when we think, let the thinking be a thinking with God doing the thinking through us, so to speak. God being fused within us. And then when we listen to somebody else who's speaking or who's teaching something, help us listen in a divine way as well. And when we think, help the thinking be fused with the divine thinking. Hashem Sifatai 
שיפתח. השם שפתי תפתח. השם שפתי תפתח. So I'd like to give you all a few blessings before we begin our encounter with each other, explorations with each other. It's a good thing to bless your friends when you're meeting up with them, or when you part from them as well. May you be blessed from the source of blessings. And may you be loved from the source of divine love. May you be guided by the source of divine guidance. so opened up that it kindles the hearts of everybody around you. May your mind be so expanded that it's expanding everything that it sees. love be so endless it becomes a love that is spread like wildfire and like water to everyone it comes in contact with may you transform all of your falls into elevation May you know the one who knows all. May your thoughts be the thoughts of your soul and of your heart, in addition to being the thoughts of your mind. always be surrounded with all the people that love you. And may you know the one who knows all. And may you always be occupied fully with what you're here in this world for to do. joy be so full that it fills the joy of everybody that you've come encountered with. May you live to see the world elevate to a whole new level of being. May you truly actualize your higher calling. May you be grateful for everything that happens to you day and night, whether it be something that's perceived good or something that doesn't seem to be good at the time. May you find paradise in this life right now, right here and right now. A 
שם שפתה היא תפתח. שם שפתה היא תפתח. השם שפתה היא תפתח. אופי יגיד תהילתך. in the Zohar, which will be the topic of the evening, and I'm going to ask Stephen to, since we're all in this together, to read it twice, read it through twice, but we don't get the first time, we'll get the second time, hopefully. Read it twice. Read it twice. How about me and somebody else read it once? Somebody else can read it twice. Some, another second time also. Okay, what am I reading? Male and female. Male and female. That seems to be the discussion of the night here. All right. This is the book of the generations of Adam. On the day that God created Adam, in the likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and called their name Adam on the day they were created. And that's Genesis 5, 1 and 2. So that's from the Torah. Now this is the Zohar. Rabbi Shimon said, High mysteries are revealed in these two verses. Male and female, he created them. To make known the glory on high, the mystery of faith. Out of this mystery, Adam was created. Come and see. With the mystery by which heaven and earth were created, Adam was created. Of them it is written, these are the generations of heaven and earth. Of Adam it is written, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Of them it is written, when they were created. Of Adam it is written, on the day they were created. Male and female, he created them. From here we learn, any image that does not embrace male and female is not a high and true image. We have established this in the mystery of our Mishnah. Come and see, the Blessed Holy One does not place his abode in any place where male and female are not found together. Blessings are found only in a place where male and female are found. As it is written, he blessed them and called their name Adam on the day they were created. It is not written, he blessed him and called his name Adam. A human being is only called Adam when male and female are as one. Should I read it again? Sure. It's even slower, Stephen. Even slower. Slower? Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, well now everyone knows what's coming. <laughs> This is the book of the generations of Adam. On the day that God created Adam, in the likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and called their name Adam on the day they were created. Rabbi Shimon said, high mysteries are revealed in these two verses. Male and female, he created them. To make known the glory on high, the mystery of faith. Out of this mystery, Adam was created. Come and see, with the mystery by which heaven and earth were created, Adam was created. Of them it is written, these are the generations of heaven and earth. Of Adam it is written, this is the book of the generations of Adam. 
Of them it is written, when they were created. Of Adam it is written, on the day they were created. Male and female, he created them. From here we learn, any image that does not embrace male and female is not a high and true image. We have established this in the mystery of our Mishnah. Come and see. The Blessed Holy One does not place his abode in any place where male and female are not found together. Blessings are found only in a place where male and female are found. As it is written, he blessed them and called their name Adam on the day they were created. It is not written, he blessed him and called his name Adam. A human being is only called Adam when male and female are as one. Okay, that was very nice. Nice reading. Thank you. That was the Zohar. A translated piece of the Zohar. The Zohar is the Book of Enlightenment or the Book of Splendor. According to some traditions, it was written about uh, 800 or 900 years ago, but according to the traditional <coughs> tradition, it was written back in the days of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai about 2,000 years ago by a group of scholars and saints who basically were walking around the hills of the Galilee and connecting to a higher state of consciousness, a state of transcendence, and bringing forth enlightenment, bringing forth splendor, just as the name Zohar suggests. So what we just learned is one little piece of the essence of the creation of man and women, of male and female. And just to begin things, to understand what we just learned, would you like to share what you understood from what you, what we just said? Just something. I'll look at my notes. Okay. <laughs> Please do. Uh, well, I think the, the main point is what it says at the end, that to be a full human being, you have to be both male and female in the truest sense. Where did I, I lost where we were. Here. Um, these are my notes from our lesson. All right. Completeness and wholeness occurs when male and female are together, which is a human being. Then I wrote, the universe is built with male and female templates. We need to understand what male and female aspects are. There are many varieties of male and female paradigms in Kabbalah. Uh, let's see. Then when we're talking about heaven and earth, we're talking about the fusion of the spiritual and the material. And then there's a principle here with Adam and Eve. This fusion principle. Doesn't make sense what I wrote here. I have reunite, then I have separation of unity, and then I have the goal is the reuniting. I guess that does make sense. Uh, so heaven represents the upper worlds which is a male trait. The earth represents a lower world, which is a female trait. Uh, then we talked about psychological traits of male and female. And the emphasis on building up the malchut, which is the feminine principle. And this whole thing, I guess, is about the rectification of the feminine principle. And then I have here, female, the power of invisibility. Um, the paradox 
of everything is perfect as is, yet everything is lacking. Couples need to be in harmony in relationships. To improve the world, male needs to see a world that is lacking and try to improve that world, which is tikkun. And then whole new levels of understanding. Those are my notes. Okay, very good. Thank you for sharing that. Try to reduce it down to basically one idea. There was a process going on. It's a process that we learned about in this teaching right here is the same process that happened in the creation. According to the Kabbalistic texts, the creation process happened first with a a presence of the endless one, a presence of the divine, a presence of the infinite one, of infinity. And Kabbalah teaches there was nothing else in the world, there was nothing else around except for God's infinite presence. And what God wanted to do was to basically reveal and give and make room for a a world, a creation. So what God did is basically got out of the way. And that getting out of the way, whether that's literal or whether that's just a figurative way of expressing God hiding from that particular place, that getting out of the way created a, a void, an empty space. And into that empty space, there was room for other creations besides just an infinite divine being to be created, to, to be present. And into that void, as we know that nature abhors a void, into that void there came down creation. There came down all created beings. And so into this void, there comes down created beings that have at least the image of being finite as opposed to the infinite presence of the creator. And the purpose of that dichotomy of both the infinite one and the finite creations is so that the finite creations can discover ultimately that really the essence and the nature of the world is infinite and to try in the course of history to re-infinitize the world back to the original state of being that it was. So we have a sort of a divine physics principle, which is basically what Kabbalah is all about. Kabbalah is, a, is teachings of divine physics, basically. Holy physics. So the divine physics that we're learning here is that they started with an expansion and that expansion led to a contraction. There was an expansion of just infinite light and infinite godliness. And that led to a contraction that allowed the world to exist. And that contraction ultimately will re-expand into an infinity again until everybody understands and realizes that there's really nothing but the infinite one. And that each of us are also a part of that infinite one. That's the Kabbalistic creation process, in a nutshell. That process is like any beginning process that's taught in Torah, is basically a paradigm, basically a template of all other processes. We have a saying that our sages teach us that everything goes after the beginning. Everything that happens in the beginning basically is a pattern that is emulated and repeated in all subsequent processes. So if you want to trace any process, you can always trace it back to this creation process, to these basic expansion, contraction, and re-expansion processes. So something very similar happened with the creation of man and woman, with male and female. 
And that's what we're learning in this piece right here in the Zohar. We're learning that basically what happened is that in the beginning, God created man and woman as one, as one being. Two parts of one being. And then God separated them. And they, in their separation, are seeking constantly to reunite with each other in order to be one again. And that expresses itself on many, many different levels. So you have the same basic physics principle. The creation is based on in the dynamic or the equation of the male and female paradigm that Kabbalah teaches. That basically there is a oneness of male and female and that oneness is separated at one point and then that separation is brought back together at another point. We see that in the idea of a what's called a soulmate or in Jewish literature, Jewish lingo it's called a beshert where a person is searching for their other half, is searching for the male or the female that is the other half that completes them, actually. And what we're learning with the Zohar, what the Zohar is teaching us here, is that, the, that a person who is living somehow only with half, only with their male aspect, whether it's an internal male aspect or an external male aspect or the internal female or the external female, and they're not allowing the other half of themselves to be actualized, to be expressed, to be lived in their life, so they're only living half of an existence. And they're, with that half of an existence, our sages teach us in the Talmud, our sages teach us that when a person doesn't have the other half of their, of their being, i.e. The, the male or the female half, so they're living half of a life, and their joy is half joy, and their being is half being, and their sensitivity is half sensitivity, and their humor is half humor, and everything about them is only half, is only a part, is only a part of really what they ultimately can be. And so the Zohar is teaching that the real blessing comes when the two halves are joined together to become a whole. So what are these two halves? What are these different parts of ourselves? And I want to stress here that when, when the Zohar is talking about the male and female paradigm, it's not necessarily talking about a man and a woman. Because inside of each of us, we have a male and female aspect to ourselves. And so that male and female, we have to somehow find inside of ourselves somehow identify it, somehow allow it to be expressed and somehow united to turn ourselves into a whole person. Not that we don't need to also search for a physical other half for somebody who is not the same sex as we are, that we do. There is an external need to do that as well. But the Kabbalistic teaching is that we need to actually find that inside of ourselves. And the more we actualize the male and female inside of ourselves, the more smooth and conducive we will be to get along with the opposite sex. Because what we have basically in relating to other people, our key, the mechanism that we have, that we enact, that we activate in relating to other people is what we have inside of ourselves. It, said, it is said about Moshe, about Moses, our teacher, that Moses was able to basically understand and relate and to connect to every one of the 600,000, not people, but 600,000 souls of the Israelites in the desert, when they were in the desert. And then his future father-in-law, Jethro, Yitro, Yitro, came along and said, Moses, you're taking on too much. You're trying to judge and you're trying to help and you're trying to guide all of the children of Israel. It's much too much for you to do. And so, in respect for his father-in-law, he said, okay, so, you know, we'll divide up the job, we'll divide up the work. And, 
And what happened is that they gave him, they, gave, they dealt out the responsibility of judging and dealing with the people to the, what are called the ministers of ten and the ministers of hundreds and the ministers of thousands and the ministers of tens of thousands. But the point is before that Moses knew, he was able to connect and understand and relate to every one of the people of Israel. 600,000 souls, which there were millions of people actually. But each of them, some of those people are only part of a certain soul. So that is the relating, that's the ability inside of ourselves. And it's a measure of a person. The greater the person is, the more they can relate to different types of people. The more people that they can relate to, the more they can be a counselor, a guide, a therapist, a person who can point another person in the right direction. So the more we can relate to the male and female side and inside of ourselves, the more we can relate to our husbands and our wives, the more we can relate to our male and female friends as well. So we need to know what that means. Who is this male and female? What is, what's the personal, personality profile inside of us that we need to relate to? So to begin that exploration, what is the male and what is the female personality according to the Kabbalistic teaching? I'd like to share with you a story that my wife shared with me when we first got married. And subsequently I saw that the story that she shared with me, though it was, it was just a story at the time, is a very, very deep story. And I saw that story in a number of very, very deep texts and sources. The story is the story of a Pied Piper, basically. And there's a Pied Piper who plays his flute and marches down, strolls down the the streets of life. He's a holy stroller, this Pied Piper. And he walks down the streets of life and he plays his flute. And his wife, faithfully and dutifully, marches right behind him, right behind the Pied Piper. Every move he makes, she's right behind him. He turns up the music, she turns up the music. He turns up the volume, she turns up the volume. He marches faster, she marches faster. She's, she's right behind him. She's supporting him. Every move he makes. But what my wife told me is that what you don't see is that the music that the Pied Piper is playing was written by her. She composed the music. And that's the analogy. And the analogy goes very, very deep. We say in rabbinic Judaism, traditional Judaism, we say that the who is the kosher woman, who is the proper Jewish woman, the proper Jewish wife, she who does the ratzon of her husband. So that could sound very chauvinistic if you don't understand what that means. She who does the will of her husband. So you can say what, he is the, he's the boss and whatever he says goes, whatever he says needs to be done. So that's not the simple meaning. The simple meaning is that the kosher Jewish wife is the wife who is able to basically bring out the will of her husband. Just as the kosher Jewish husband is able to bring out the role and the, and the will of his wife as well. To bring out their best side. See, it goes back to the fact that we are all, our souls are all mapped out in a world of souls which are measured by Kabbalistic spherot, they're measured by Kabbalistic body parts, they're measured by Kabbalistic soul levels. And certain people have an affinity for each other because they come from the same root source. The root source, whether that's a man, a husband and wife, or whether that's two friends or whatever, wherever they come from, certain people who come from the same place, whose souls are come from the same root, they're connected to each other. The closer, the more of an affinity they have for each other, the more they have a mutual interest in each other's well-being 
the more they have a mutual interest in each other's self-actualization, the more they have a mutual interest in the rectification of each, of each other. And that's a soul connection. So this Pied Piper's wife, she wrote the music for her husband to play and she leads, she follows the music. She's, she's an obedient wife. But she's an obedient wife in a way that she's really the leader. She's guiding him where he needs to be guided to. And that's part of the female paradigm. A part of the female paradigm is to be able to, at the one time, at one and the same time, to accept and receive and be passive and convey an idea that she has nothing of her own except for what is given to her. And when she conveys that, she empowers the other person so much that the truth of the matter is, she's really in control of the other person. And when we, whether male or female, whether man or woman, when we exercise our female paradigm and we were open to other people and when we relate to other people, when we relate to them in a way where we basically say that I want to receive from you. I don't want to sell you something. I want to receive from you. You have wisdom. You have something of value for me. You have something that you can give me. I'm an open vessel. Please fill me up with your wisdom. Fill me up with, with who you are, with what you are. We're empowering that other person. And that's our female paradigm. The same Zohar says that the definition of the Malchut, of the, of the sphere, of the Kabbalistic sphere, the Kabbalistic profile, the Kabbalistic character trait that characterizes the woman is that she has nothing except for what the other person gives her. It's the power of receiving. But when you do the receiving in the proper way, so that sphere, which is called the Malchut, which is the lowest of the spherot, the lowest on the totem pole, so to speak, is actually the highest. It's actually the will. It actually is the guiding light for all the rest of the spirit because it fills itself up with what it's given because it has the guts and it has the security to be able to be filled up with what the other person is giving to them. And when that happens, that person becomes filled, impregnated, so to speak, becomes a complete being, and then becomes a leader, which is an insight also into what a Jewish leader is, according to the Kabbalistic sources. A leader is basically somebody who says, I have nothing of my own. It's not somebody who says, vote for me because I, I am better than the next guy. It says, I have nothing of my own and therefore I am receiving everything. I look up to receive from other people, I look up to receive from God, I look up to receive from everybody. And when I do, then I'm able to be a leader. That's called Malchut, that's the lowest of the Kabbalistic Sfirot, that's the feminine paradigm of the Sfirot. And when I'm able to do that, when a leader is able to do that, then they have everything. When a person says, I have nothing, ultimately they will have everything. So the paradigm leader of the, of the Jewish people is King David. King David is the one whose, basically his legacy is to be the king, the, the ultimate king of the Jewish people, both genetically and spiritually. And the one who, we say that the, even when the Messiah comes, when the Mashiach comes, he will be a, a scion, he will be both a spiritual and genetic predecessor. He will, he will have received his blood and his spirit from, the, from King David. Because King David is that person who says, I've had nothing of my own. I'm receiving everything I receive. And when you receive everything you receive, then you're able to be a true Melech, which is from the word Malchut. You're able to be a true leader in that sense. So that's the female principle. It's one aspect of the female principle. Empowered receiving. 
empowered receiving so much that the empowerment actually becomes a giving. In order to receive like that properly from God, so a person is able to be a female, to have to exercise your female paradigm in relation to, to God in your life. So what you need to do is to say that God, everything that you give me is perfect. As perfect as is. I trust you. I have nothing of my own. And everything that you send my way is I know that you love me. I know that you care for me. I know that you would do nothing wrong, that you would send nothing wrong to me. And so everything that you send my way, I consider to be perfect just the way it is. Even though it may seem to be very difficult, and very hard, and very imperfect. But it's right for me at this time in my life, in this way, in this state of readiness that I'm in right now. So that's the idea of uh, looking up towards God and being playing the role of the female paradigm and receiving everything just perfect the way it is. Even if I did wrong and I blew it and I, I should have done what I did properly, I still need to be able to look up and say, well, I did that because at the time, that's what I knew, that's what I was able to do, that was what I was driven to do, and I consider that to be perfect as this. The male paradigm is one who looks at the world and says the world is totally lacking. The world is imperfect. The world needs to be perfect. Everything that I encounter is lacking. Everything needs to be perfected properly in its proper way. So I'm constantly going through life like a sponge, like a vacuum cleaner, absorbing all that is lacking in my life in order to fill, to fill myself up with that. Bala, we have a teaching that's called, a concept that's called the Holy Sparks. And the Holy Sparks, the idea of the Holy Sparks, it's explained by the masters of Hasidut, the Baal Shem Tov, is that everything that we encounter in life is basically an opportunity to complete something which is lacking inside of us. So every person that we encounter, every conversation, that we engage in, every new piece of learning that we learn, every challenge that we face, that is customized, that is sent to us, especially to for us to be able to complete that which is lacking. So the male paradigm is seeking always to complete that which is lacking, as opposed to saying everything is perfect the way it is, say everything is imperfect. Everything needs to be perfected. Everything is lacking. Everything is an opportunity to improve. And when you put those two together, put the idea together of perfect as is with everything needs perfecting and everything needs to be collected and completed, then you have reunited the male and female inside yourself, inside your life, inside your consciousness, inside your marriage. That's one aspect of how the male and female are connected together. And, and they are a, it's a paradox. Right? Kabbalah has no fear of paradoxes. There's plenty of paradoxes to deal with in Kabbalah. And this is one of them. And a paradox, being able to carry a paradox basically means that you have no fear that even though you say that everything is perfect as is, you know that everything is imperfect at the same time. And they both work, and they're both real. And both of them, each of them have their place in time. So to be a complete human being with both male and female aspects, what we need to do is to walk with that paradox, is to have both the male and female, to see things the way the, the wife of the Pied Piper sees things, is, as being a receiver and being an open receiver for everything that happens 
but at the same time to write that music of the one who's we're receiving from. At the same time to step in and to make things better. And that's the beginning of the discussion of male and female.